Eventually, one of the stories that I end up covering here on this channel in regards to the war in Ukraine is going to be a bridge too far, or perhaps a dam too far, or a pipeline too far, or a nuclear power plant too far. And it's going to do what I have said since day one. It's going to spark an escalatory spiral that cannot be stopped before it reaches World War III. When is this war going to end and who is trying to end it? I'm Stuart Hooper, a lecturer in political science and PhD researcher. Be sure to subscribe if you are new to the channel where we cover international politics from a critical angle. Hit like on the video, it helps a lot and it's free. And please leave me your comments on all of this below. Because there is a hell of a lot to comment on here. We are talking about a new state having nuclear weapons. We're talking about attacks on civilian infrastructure that are causing abject devastation. And we're also now seeing attacks within Russia potentially using Western-provided weapons. Where do you think this all ends? I can tell you with a short and sweet answer, nowhere good. Let's start with what just happened overnight. The attack on this dam in Kherson, which is already causing complete disaster in that region of Ukraine. And here we have it, the major dam collapsing in southern Ukraine, flooding villages as Moscow and Kiev trade blame. Yes, of course, the Ukrainians are saying this was the Russians and the Russians are saying this was the Ukrainians. Big surprise there. The alternative theory that's being put forward is that this was a dam in a complete state of disrepair, hasn't been properly maintained in years, and was at breaking point, and finally went ahead and it broke. The dam literally broke. Um, all three plausible theories. The important thing, however, is that we have 80 settlements, 80 different towns and villages in the area threatened by the destruction of this dam and the flooding that is now currently taking place as I speak and make this video. But perhaps even more importantly than that, as we can see here, quote, the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, Europe's biggest, relies in large part on water from the dam's now emptying reservoir. And of course, the IAEA came out and said that there's no immediate risk to safety. Please don't worry, don't panic. Um, there are alternative water sources that can last for months. Well, that perhaps could be wishful thinking. So who exactly is responsible for this? Is it the Russians? Is it the Ukrainians? Is it just a dam that's in a complete state of disrepair and it finally collapsed? Well, I don't think we are going to know the answer for a very long time, if ever. Because right now, we are in the middle of a war that is very much a propaganda war as much as it is a hot war between these two sides. And we've seen exactly the same stuff play out when it came to the Nord Stream pipelines and everything that happened there. I think there are probably plausible reasons for both sides to want to attack this dam. As was noted in the article, this was in a region that has been controlled by Russia for over a year. So perhaps the Ukrainians saw this as an attempt to, well, we'll sacrifice this small part of the country because we think it's going to do massive damage to Russian military capabilities in that region. That's absolutely plausible. Or perhaps the Russians looked across the river and they see perhaps this Ukrainian counteroffensive that it's supposed to have been arriving in the spring, now we're in the summer, side issue, but perhaps the Russians saw something in terms of Ukrainian military maneuvers and believed that, well, if we destroy the dam and we do it right now, we're going to be able to hold the Ukrainians off in this region for a significant period of time because this is really very much a defensive move. This is stopping the other side from doing something. The question is, well, which side was trying to stop the other from doing something, whatever that may have been. So I think it's plausible for either side here. Um, but the, the issue is, this is now a huge humanitarian disaster in a country that does not need any more humanitarian disasters. It's got enough already. So now we have 80 different towns and villages that have to suffer because this war is dragging on and on and on. And nobody on either, on either side 
is willing to come to the table and have a discussion to end the war. When that happens, things like this will stop. But right now, we have 80,000 villages on the brink of disaster, if not already underwater as I'm making this video. We have a nuclear power plant that's already been in the crosshairs of both sides for the entirety of this conflict in one way or another. And we sit once again on the brink of disaster. What is it going to take for one of these two sides to say, you know what? Let's come to the table and figure this thing out. Let's have a discussion. Let's talk this out. Because clearly, the escalation in violence is not helping anyone. But just in case you want a bit more escalation in violence, well, we've got that for you too. Just last week or a couple of weeks ago now, um, in a move that for the most part seemingly went under the radar and has not been mentioned since, Russia moves ahead with deployment of tactical nukes in Belarus. And this is a truly massive development in the conflict. This is the Kremlin's first deployment of such bombs outside Russia since the 1991 fall of the Soviet Union. And Sergei Shoigu, the Russian defense minister, said, quote, The collective West is essentially waging an undeclared war against our countries. It was doing all it could to prolong and escalate the armed conflict in Ukraine. Couple of important points. Shoigu is absolutely correct in saying that the West is trying to prolong this war. That is totally true. The West is trying to degrade the Russian military as much as possible at the expense of Ukrainians, unfortunately, by really waging what you can only really call at this point a proxy war with Russia via Ukraine. That's correct. But what has the West said about Russia? The West has been saying that Putin is seeking to re-establish the old Soviet Union and is willing to use force to do it. What has Russia just done? It has just moved nuclear weapons into Belarus in a move that looks like it's trying to do what? Restructure the old Soviet Union. What am I saying? Both sides are in the wrong. NATO expansion throughout the 1990s? Bad idea. Russian invasion of Ukraine just over a year ago? Terrible idea. This is a disaster on all sides. And we have a State Department spokesman who said, quote, there will be severe consequences if nuclear weapons are used, but I will just add we have seen no reason to adjust our strategic nuclear posture or any indications that Russia is preparing to use a nuclear weapon. That almost makes Ukraine a de facto member of NATO. That is saying, if Russia attacks Ukraine with a nuclear weapon, we're going to respond with severe consequences. Isn't, isn't that collective defense? Isn't that Article 5? Isn't that NATO? So Ukraine is already a NATO member in all but official status at this point. But... Where are we now? As I've been arguing, since day one of this war, which now really cannot be denied, we are in a new nuclear world. For people like me that grew up really during the war on terror, that's when I was starting to pay attention to the news and what was going on in the world, this is entirely new. We have a whole generation of people, two generations of people at this point, since the end of the Cold War, 1991, who have absolutely no idea what it means to live in a nuclear world. So we have a huge number of people in the world that have really no idea about how to grasp this situation, no idea how dangerous this situation is, haven't lived through anything like this before. So we're in a lot of trouble. So we really need to end this conflict, as I've said again and again and again, as quickly as possible. Because the other important development, which we're about to touch on, um, this, I think, this is the kind of thing 
the, if you're really looking for a Russian response directly against some kind of Western target in some way, however that may be, cyber war, a strike on a port or an airport somewhere, this, I think, is going to be what causes it. Belgium probes alleged use of its weapons in attack on Russia. A report claimed military aid given to Ukraine by NATO countries was used by pro-Ukraine fighters to attack Russia. And it takes a small country like Belgium to raise the alarm on something like this. Because Belgium is the type of nation that will be completely eviscerated in a new, wider European conflict. It doesn't stand a chance of survival. So it takes a small nation like Belgium sometime to stand up and say, Wait a second, this isn't what we agreed, and we're kind of worried about the consequences. Unlike the United Kingdom the United States, Germany at this point, which has done a complete 180, apparently, in its position on Ukraine. But let's see what these Belgians had to say. The Prime Minister, Alexander de Croo, he said, quote, Our defence ministry and its intelligence agencies have started an investigation and are asking for information to determine exactly what happened. European weapons are delivered to Ukraine under the condition that they are used on Ukrainian territory with the purpose of defending that territory. And we have strict controls in place to see that this is the case. He highlighted that Belgium would take the situation very seriously but declined to comment on possible consequences if the reports were confirmed. So just to put that as simply as possible... NATO-provided weapons are being used to attack Russia. Not Russian forces in Ukraine, but to attack Russian targets within Russia. NATO weapons are being used to attack Russian targets within Russia. Do I need to repeat that again? Is that clear why that's probably a bad thing? Thing. Why that is going to lead to the kind of escalation that I have been warning about on this channel since the very day this war began. And Russia should never have invaded Ukraine to begin with. I've said that again and again and again. We have to get away from war. This is a prime example of what war does. Absolutely nothing good and only makes the situation worse. But on the western side of things... What is this perhaps going to do? This is going to make populations start to question the extent to which their governments are providing weapons to Ukraine, which are then being used to attack Russia. Because Western populations don't want to go to war with Russia. Nobody wins in that scenario. I'm not even sure the military-industrial complex, who I talk about a lot on this channel, wins in an outright hot war with Russia. Because the second that goes nuclear, it's all over for everyone, right? So we'll see what happens with this. But we had those drone attacks in Moscow. They ended up hitting a middle-class, upper-class area of Moscow from everything that I've heard on that particular attack uh, a week or so ago now. That one I don't think was a Russian false flag. I think the one over the Kremlin, there was some... I mean, that was just such a small little thing that ended up being shot down over the Kremlin. Very easy for Putin to then turn around and say, look, they're attacking us. They're attacking the government. We must stand strong. Putin does not want middle class and upper class neighborhoods in Moscow being attacked by drones. If those people start to turn against Putin... Then it becomes far more than the uh, the peaceniks in the street, right? That becomes far more than the protesters in the street, the young liberals. Um, as soon as you start bringing um, in the middle class, the upper classes into political opposition against you, that's going to become much tougher for Putin. And of course, he's got the internal problems with um, the leader of the, the Wagner group, <clears throat> Prigozhin, 
Um, this is uh, just overall within Russia. This is a situation that's rapidly spiraling out of control. Um, but here we are. Um, the Western world seemingly willing to, to make it worse. No one in the West or the East, for that matter, really pushing for any significant peace plan. Um, we have the American election coming up. So, of course, American politics... Um, really not interested in foreign affairs right now. Um, and in fact, if you pay any attention to American politics right now, you know that the only hot stories are to do with identity politics. Um, I'll just leave you guys with this. If identity politics are your focus right now, with this current state of the world, you're spinning your wheels. You're putting all of your political effort, all of your political time and attention in completely the wrong direction. We sit on the brink of a global disaster. Let's get this fixed. Please subscribe if you're new to the channel. Going to be putting out another video this week looking at the Pacific. Because guess what? We've got more problems that look just like this in the Pacific between the US and China. And there's no proxy really involved there. Taiwan, maybe. But this is looking like even far more of a direct conflict than that between Russia and the US, between China and the US. Do we really want to live in a world with a two-front World War Three? I don't think so. Subscribe if you're new, again. Um, I'll be back with that video shortly. Hopefully we make it to the end of the week. Because this is just spiraling out of control here, you guys. Um, have a good rest of your week, and I'll be back real soon.